tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Blair Campbell. I am, I guess, for all, all intents and purposes, a data protection professional. Uh, I started my, my career in information security and just happened to find myself in, in the world of privacy. And um, I've been doing that ever since. So going That's on. That's great, Brian. Right. Almost. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just at the last part of the day, and we have Brian with us. No worries. And uh, Brian would be available in Discord afterwards if uh, we have any questions for him. And I can also take any questions for him during the talk, and I'll pass it on to him afterwards. And we have Brian, and I'll just let him continue, and I'll just be out there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation. My name is Blair Campbell. I am a data protection professional. Uh, I started my field in information security, but I've really been focusing on privacy now since 2008. Um, something I, I had to show uh, to, to the audience uh, before presenting is, is my inaugural B-Sides attendance. And this is a 10 year old t-shirt that I picked up at RSA in San Francisco. Um, so I thought timing was good too. Um, so this afternoon, what I'm gonna be speaking about is the use of inclusive language and, and why it's meaningful within, within particularly our environments and touch upon some of the, the history of, of how things have kind of evolved uh, with regards to security and, and particularly when you're looking at things like standards, things like policies, and even looking at things like procedures. So a couple of entities that I'd like to point out. Uh, the first is the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, and, and I'm sure the audience is going to be familiar with both of these organizations. Um, however, the IETF is a voluntary uh, internet standards body and pretty much everything that you use online has, has gone through this entity. Um, and I'm going to touch upon their importance as long as well as NIST's uh, endeavoring into the development of inclusive language, certainly with regards to uh, its standards. And of course, everyone knows what NIST is. It's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, most of our environments are, are structured around NIST framework in probably multiple areas. And what made me think about this topic was not only our teenage teenage daughter who seems to have a, a great more mindfulness when it comes to things like pronouns, when it comes to um, classification. And I came across this article on the New York Times. This was April earlier this year. And you can see by the headline, Master Slave and the Fight Over Offensive Terms. And this is where I'll talk a bit about the IETF and, and an initiative that, that they're working on right now. And within the article, you can see, so the group which helped create technical foundation of the internet, IETF, uh, made it possible for someone with a Gmail account to communicate uh, with a friend who uses Yahoo, uh, shoppers, et cetera. Um, and now the organization, not only looking at protocols, but, but looking at standards and, and why they're meaningful, specifically in, in the field of technology. And so trying to remove terms that uh, have, have a racist history, terms like master, terms like slave, whitelist, blacklist. And so they have started the development 
of the, what they're calling the IESG statement on oppressive or exclusionary language. And I think why I found this really significant and, and certainly with the guidance that is being developed by NIST and its use of inclusive language in, in documentary standards is I've, as I said, I've been, I've been in this industry for a while and thinking about how ingrained terms become, how ingrained language is and perhaps being a little too a, a little too simple when it comes to classification uh, of, of certain terms and whether or not they could be interpreted, misconstrued. Um, and again, I, I started becoming more aware of the use of language, um, not entirely, but significantly through, through our 16 year old daughter. And if we look at some of the, the verbiage that, that has been used and, and still used to this day, um, whether you're talking about things like whitelisting, um, whether something's acceptable or allowable, um, blacklist, you know, means to block something. Um, but the suggested edits that are being presented by certainly NIST would be deny listing. Um, if you look at like blackmail, I haven't used the term blackmail for a while, although certainly within, within the worlds where we are, uh, things like extortion can be pretty significant. You know, when you look at things like uh, any sort of ransomware, look at what's happening in Newfoundland, et cetera, it truly is extortion. Uh, master, master data or, you know, slave nodes. Uh, you think back as far as what the connotation of those words mean today and, and how now it just seems to be very backward looking. And so as opposed to using master or slave, use primary, secondary. And I know in my workplace, this has been, this has been adopted and we're actually going through and we're looking at the documentation uh, that we have internally and how it is that we can tweak it. Um, terms like way out in left field. I work with a very small team the team that I am on, uh, we have a team member from South America. We have two team members that are from the Caribbean, um, where well, maybe not so much Venezuela, but if you look at the Caribbean and, and you think of what sort of exposure do people have in the Caribbean when it comes to baseball? Um, you know, it's, I would think, cricket or perhaps soccer slash football. Um, so when you start using terms that people don't understand and they don't compute, um, there's a disconnect there. And so as opposed to using way out in left field, uh, made very inaccurate measurements. Uh, moving to male connector, female connector, calling it a plug and socket. And, and I think these, these terms are already being adopted, um, but, but I, think, I think we can do even better than what we're seeing here. And some of the additional recommend, recommendations uh, consider good, clear words. So specific words, words that really speak to things as more an object as opposed to a, a being. Um, and again, rather than using, using common terms or colloquial terms that are terms that we have familiarities with, we, okay, as a Canadian, I, I often say, you know, as opposed to managing a problem, I'll say that I'm stick handling a problem. Uh, 
think of people that happen to be in the Caribbean, people who happen to be in South America. How many people would even understand what it is that I'm saying or what it is that I'm referencing? Um, bias terms, getting back to the blacklist, whitelist. Um, and it, it can affect how people understand what it is that you're trying to say when, when you're using terms uh, such as master and slave. And it gets back to the negative stereotype of, of that language. And not only do you see that happening, certainly within, within the world of computing, um, you're now seeing changes being made in environments that, I mean, you think of the main bedroom in a home uh, it's referred to as the master bedroom, but that that too is changing. So you're seeing a bit of a, a shift in the real estate industry, which I find to be uh, actually quite enlightened of them. Um, again, avoid using gender type issues, whether things happen to be male or female, and you know, use of condescending or, or reductive language in favor that, you know, groups would rather be referenced by. Um, and, and I think if, 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 you're having, if you're having a struggle with replacing words or um, thinking of ways to substitute certain language, there, there are a couple of resources that I've included in the deck. Uh, the one is from the American Psychological Association call, and it's bias-free language. Uh, and the other within the, within the speaker notes of the presentation points to the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, both are excellent resources. And if you go to the APA site and, and go to the bias-free language page, you can see where they emphasize the need to talk about all people with inclusivity and respect. And what's neat about what the APA provides is looking at characteristics and perhaps better ways to use language. And, and you may find that language is is, isn't really that, um, isn't particularly sensitive when, when I think about where, where I work with regards to uh, the fields that I'm involved with, but, but I find that things are changing. And, and whether you're looking at things such as how to speak to people that have a disability, um, again, talking about gender, racial and, and ethnic identity, sexual orientation. Um, and I can, I can point to why this, this approach really is logical uh, within business environments. And I know for the company that I work for, which employs upwards of 200,000 people, um, there's gonna be a lot of different people and, and, and there's going to be people that perhaps just don't have the exposure to some of the nuances of, of Canadianisms um, and just language in general as, as it's evolved in Canada. And something that I found is, so you have something like uh, whether it's the APA or whether it's, you know, looking at the Chicago Manual of Style, um, kind of the obverse of that is, you know, if, if you go on to the AICPA site, um, and I know certainly in, in my area of work, we, we certainly leverage uh, their, their framework, uh, most notably with the general accepted privacy principles. So when I'm going in and I'm looking at an entity within our environment, I'll use the gap 
principle framework to understand where our maturity level is within the organization. Um, but even to today, where if you're to search for the term segregation of duties, I find it interesting that the AI CPA has, has the language segregation of duties. And now if you go to Wikipedia, for example, as opposed to having segregation of duties, it's separation of duties. So this is slowly and organically um, being, being adopted with antiquated language in my position or in my, my perspective um, is, is, being, is being updated to, to be reflective of, of what's happening in our communities, what's happening in, in our field. And, you know, I came across something and, and I was really pleased to see this. I don't know if, if many of the uh, participants are members of ISC squared. Uh, I have their CISSP, um, but something I came across when I was building this deck was what IC squared is, is calling inclusion ready. And this was just unveiled at, at their recent security uh, Congress. I think it was about two weeks ago. And what it's specifically working towards is what the IETF is doing, what NIST is doing, and looking at an organization like IAC Squared who has, or that has, excuse me, uh, 130,000 uh, certified information security professionals. And, and I know when certainly from my view, when it comes to the entity that speaks to certainly the, the security side of the fence, when it comes to computing, um, IC squared is it. And I, I just think it's fabulous that, that they're also starting to adopt this sort of, of language. And so whether you're looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, um, another article that I came across was from the World Economic Forum. So why cybersecurity needs a more diverse and inclusive workforce. And what will point to that is, you know, if you look at certainly the field of information security, supposedly there are upwards of a quarter of a million vacancies um, within the field that can't be filled. And, and I'd have to believe if I look at certainly Canada in general, you know, this headline from the Globe and Mail, no one considers Canada's immigration record to be a big deal and that's remarkable. Well, what's remarkable about it is if we look at the birth rate in Canada, the birth rate is, is decreasing um, from of those who live here. Um, so we're, we're going to need more people. And these people come from all over the world. So the country is on target to have 400,000 plus people immigrate to Canada every single year. And many of these people are going to end up in the field of information security or computing or data protection. And, and we want to make it so that we can broaden the pool. We can, we can make it so that we don't have the disconnect in language and that the language that we present is, is clear and not, not objective or subjective to our exposure of the language, but taking a, a global perspective on, on language within, within the field of computing. And I think if you look at the infographic uh, 
of population projections. Um, it's, it's huge. We're, we're getting people from all over the place. And I, I can speak specifically in Toronto where um, people of my demographic, uh, people of my ethnicity are now, now the minority uh, within the city of Toronto. And you know, it just speaks to what a fabulous city is with regards to Toronto is with regards to making it an inviting community to the point to where people want to move here and, and people are moving here. So really at the end of the day, it's, it's in organizations best interest to not only recruit talent, but to maintain talent and, and to clarify what it is that you're trying to convey. Because if you haven't been exposed to certain words, certain languages, it makes it very difficult to, to not only break into that area, but understand what it is that a role entails or what it is that one needs to do. Um, and with this slide, uh, this is my last slide. Um, I, I think that there are some great resources that, that you can leverage within this deck. And if where you work isn't taking this approach, um, I, I can certainly find some documentation outside of this material um, that can absolutely reinforce that it would be to the betterment of your organization. And with that, I defer to questions.